I'm going to ask the, uh, it is 2 p.m., 2 p.m., time to go back to work. Clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. I'm going to ask the clerk to ring the bell, let everybody know we're back at work. The clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. These first two resolutions are invitation resolutions. They are being read for the first time today and refer to the Committee on Rules, a resolution for Representative James 135th, commending Curtis Lee Atkinson, inviting him to be recognized by the House of Representatives. A resolution by Representative Beasley Teague of the 65th, a resolution commending Dr. Beverly Scott and inviting her to be recognized by the House of Representatives. Both those resolutions being read for the first time today and being referred to the Committee on Rules. The following resolutions are being read for the first time today for adoption. A resolution by Representative Nimmer, 178th, recognizing the need to raise awareness of Down syndrome. A resolution by Representative Smith, the 70th, recognizing and commending Ms. Barbara Landreth. Resolution by Representative Ralston, the 7th, recognizing and commending the 94th birthday of Mrs. Adele Mercer. Resolution by Representative O'Neill, the 146th, recognizing and commending Major General Robert McMahon on the occasion of his retirement. Resolution by Representative Lindsay, the 54th, recognizing and commending Ms. Yvonne Yancey on her retirement. Resolution by Representative Setzler, the 35th, recognizing and commending Coach Gary Varner. Resolution by Representative Setzler, 35th, recognizing and commending Mr. Richard McKee, being named Ackworth Middle School 2011-2012 Teacher of the Year. Resolution by Representative Setzler, 35th, recognizing and commending Coy J. Dunn, Jr., Kennesaw Mountain High School 2011-2012 Teacher of the Year, Cobb County 2011-2012 Teacher of the Year. Resolution by Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Luther Judson Price Middle School Football Team, 2011 Atlanta Public Schools Middle School Football Championship. Resolution by Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Ms. Jerry Chapman. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, the 65th, recognizing and commending Representative Sharon Cooper. Resolution by Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Ms. Ruthie Garrett Walls. Resolution by Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Mr. Arthur Queen. Resolution by Representative Taylor, the 79th, recognizing and commending Mr. Danny Ross. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, honoring Marcia Anderson, occasion of her promotion to Major General, United States Army. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Ms. Angie Bates. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Honorable William C. Randall. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, honoring the life and memory of Honorable Grace Wilkerson Davis. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Mrs. Janelle Yvette Lennon. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, honoring the life and memory of Honorable Betty Jean Clark. Resolution by Representative Brooks, 63rd, on the life and memory, Mr. James E. Young. Resolution Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Mrs. Helen Mills. Resolution Representative Dudgeon, 24th, recognizing March 7th, 2012, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis awareness day at the state capitol. Resolution Representative Waits, the 60th, recognizing and commending Chairman Eldrin Bell. Resolution by Representative Henry, the 67th, recognizing and commending Douglas County Chamber Singers on their 10th anniversary celebration. A resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Ms. Deborah Mack. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Dr. Sherry Blake. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing and commending Dr. Pauline Knight Othusi. 
Resolution for Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing commending the Honorable Georgia Montgomery Davis Powers. Resolution for Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing commending Miss Dana Lemon. Resolution for Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizing commending Miss Sherry Rochelle Hopkins. Resolution by Representative Waits, 60th, recognizes commending Reverend Timothy McDonald III. Resolution by Representative Waits, 60th, recognizes commending Ms. Vernell Mosley. Resolution by Representative Yates of 73rd, recognizing the Veterans Remembered Flag. Resolution by Representative Taylor of 79th, recognizes commending Mr. Robert Wittenstein. Resolution by Representative Taylor of 79th, recognizes commending Mr. Ken Wright. Resolution by Representative Johnson, 37th, recognizes commending via site. Resolution by Representative Holcomb, 82nd, commending the North Lake Community Alliance, Inc. Resolution by Representative Beasley Teague, 65th, recognizes commending Rec Representative Nikki Randall. Resolution by Representative McCall, 30th, commending the Georgia peanut industry, recognizing March 6, 2012, as peanut butter and jelly day at the Capitol. Resolution representing Chanel 116th recognizes commending Dr. William H. Rhodes Jr. And a resolution representing Smith 131st recognizes commending Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Georgia on the occasion of its 75th anniversary through the privilege resolutions. <clears throat> Is there objection to the adoption of the privilege resolutions? Chair hears none and the resolutions are adopted. The, um, many of you may have heard uh, shortly before the lunch break this morning, <clears throat> our colleague Representative Roger Bruce had to be taken uh, from here up to um, one of the hospitals here in downtown. Uh, the chair has checked on him over the lunch break and understand that he is undergoing tests and he is conscious. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask you if you would, um, as, as all of you know, Representative Bruce had a uh, fairly close call back some years ago with his health. And I think it'd just be very appropriate that we sort of take a moment of silence to uh, to pray for um, Representative Roger Bruce. Thank you very much. We're going on now to the rules calendar. We're going on to the rules calendar. The Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 916. House Bill 916. House Bill 916, Representative Knight of the 126. The bill will be entitled Act Men Code Section 4857.4, relating to bona fide conservation use property, so it change certain qualifications and restrictions regarding covenants, provide for exceptions. This bill has been for the House Committee on Ways and Means. The committee recommends the bill pass by committee substitute. The bill is being read for the third time. Chair recognizes Chairman Knight to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I bring for your consideration House Bill 916. Um, it's, it's several, our members, or uh, uh, more than several members, have brought to the attention uh, the issue of some very legitimate ag businesses out there, uh, property owners that were, were being denied either uh, admission to or renewal into the CUVA program. Uh, 916 uh, hopes to uh, make some changes to, to the CUVA uh, legislation, provide for a means in which some of these folks can uh, prove that they are a bona fide ag use. Real quickly, I'm going to go over the, the lines in the bill, <clears throat> page 2, line 36. Uh, provides that we're going to exclude from CUVA underlying property on which a resident is located. Uh, and uh, that property shall either be the uh, lesser of two acres or if there's a local zoning, order, zoning ordinance, uh, whatever that acreage size is in place. 
uh, line page five lines 136 through 142 strickens the removal of a county's ability to set a minimum of up to 25 acres uh, to be eligible under CUVA. We've amended another section of this bill uh, to include 25 acres later. Page five, line 154, uh, changes the minimum provisions for eligibility into CUVA from 10 to 25 acres. And what we've done here is we've allowed the tax assessors to go out and ask for additional relevant records reg uh, regarding the proof of the bona fide conservation use. Page five, line 156 through 164 provides that if an owner of a property provides the proof that he has filed, and this is a key portion of the bill, um, IRS form schedule E related to farm income, schedule F, which is a farm schedule, and uh, a form 4835, which is, if it's applicable, uh, is another farm rental schedule that provides proof that it should meet that test of the bona fide additional uh, relevant records. Also, we've uh, put in the tax assessor prior to denying any eligibility under this paragraph shall conduct and provide proof of a visual on-site inspection. Page six, line 190 through 96, defines the word contiguous. Page six, line 197 through 202, allows for uh, a, a property owner who, who buys a uh, contiguous acreage, and if you'll remember, we did this in FLIPA last year, that they, sh they shall be eligible to enroll that property in the existing CUVA covenant. So that is the bill, and I will be happy to answer any questions. If there are none, I would ask for your favorable consideration. Don't appear to have any. All right. Thank you. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 916 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? <coughs> if so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 916. The ayes are 157, the nays are 1. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. The clerk will read the caption to House Resolution 1177. House Resolution 1177. House Resolution 1177, Representative Williams of the 113th, a resolution recognizing United States military veterans and dedicating a highway in their honor. Resolution has been for the House Committee on Transportation. The committee recommends the resolution to pass by committee substitute. Resolution is being read today for the third time. Chair recognizes Representative Williams to present the bill. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. I rise before you this afternoon representing not only myself, but uh, 10 other members of this House. What we have before us this afternoon is the House resolution uh, dealing with road naming, road dedication uh, issues that you have submitted to the Transportation Committee. Uh, some six of these 11 deal with recognizing uh, fallen members who were peace officers, military uh, members on active duty who died in the line of service. Uh, the other five recognize community and state leaders, both living and deceased from throughout the state of Georgia. Uh, you have the bill in front of you that, that lists uh, the individual uh, honorees, so 
in the interest of time, I will not uh, go through those. I will point out to the members of this body that in, in accordance with Georgia DOT uh, policies that, uh, that the cost of signage for all of these will be borne either by family members, local government entities, or someone other than the state of Georgia. Uh, and with that, Mr. Speaker, I will yield the well and take questions. You have a question. I yield. The chair recognizes the Majority Caucus Whip. Representative Lindsay to your right for a question. Will the gentleman yield? I will. Uh, I understand this is your first time in the well? Uh, rumors to that effect persist, yes. <laughs> well, I think you have an excellent bill, but in regards to your qualifications as a legislator, did you not come in second to Lynn Smith in the cow showing contest? Uh, I did, sir. That is correct. And I was proud to come in second to the chair lady. And that was three steps above the majority whip, was it not? Uh, <laughs> if, if the gentleman says, I'm sure he knows of what he speaks. Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. No more questions. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. All those opposed to vote no and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage, on the adoption of House Resolution 1177, the ayes are 163, the nays are zero. This resolution, having received a requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 1117, House Bill 1117. House Bill 1117 by Representative Clark, 104th, a bill being title act, Minnesota Code Section 3682-1, linked to elections for approval of bonded debts, so it's changed certain provisions relating to population brackets. Bill has been for the House Committee, Intergovernmental Coordination the Committee recommends the bill to pass. Bill being read today for its third time. Chair recognizes Representative Clark to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the House. I bring for your consideration House Bill 1117. This is a population bill, and if we amend the code from a population of eight to 900,000, we will be able to preserve the status quo with elections, with uh, conducting referenda on general obligation bonds, and this would help not only Gwinnett County government, but also Gwinnett County Public Schools. I ask for your favorable consideration of House Bill 1117. Mr. You, Speaker. You have no questions. Thank you, sir. I, I yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. 
Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 1117 will vote aye. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? All members voted. If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the passage of House Bill 1117, the ayes are 164, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 897. House Bill 897. House Bill 897, Representative Harden of the 28th. A bill being entitled Act Men Title 34 relating to labor, industrial relations, so it's extensively revised the Georgia Workforce Investment Board provisions, authorized board to promulgate rules and regulations, and provisions relating to soft skills programs. The repeal provision providing for the utilization of the governor's discretionary funds to repeal the Georgia Work Ready Program. Bill had been for the House Committee on Industrial Relations. The committee recommends the bill do pass. The bill's being read today for the third time. Chair recognizes Representative Harden to present the bill. Representative Harden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I bring before you House Bill 897, uh, dealing with uh, uh, Georgia Work Ready. Uh, through the advice of legal counsel, the Georgia Work Ready program should not be in Georgia code as it is only federally funded. Let me repeat that. It is only federally funded through the Workforce Investment Act. Uh, since there was never a portion of Georgia Work Ready that was state appropriated, we need to ensure that Georgia law is accurate only to those workforce development programs that the state appropriates. So I want to uh, uh, clarify a little misnomer out there. This is not doing away with Georgia Work Ready. The assessments, the, the communities and regions are still intact. This is just simply cleaning up the language to bring us in compliance with federal law. Mr. Speaker, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to, to answer them. You have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask for your favorable consideration of House Bill 897. Thank you. Gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill. The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 897 will vote aye. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of House Bill 897, the ayes are 153. The nays are nine. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption, or read the caption, to House Bill 825. House Bill 825. 
House Bill 825, for Representative Nix, the 69th. The bill being tied Latin Minute Code Section 20 2 751.7, relating to the process for students to follow and reporting instances of alleged inappropriate behavior by teachers so as to eliminate a time frame relative to hearings before administrative law judges. The bill has been for the House Committee on Education. The committee recommends this bill pass by committee substitute. The bill is being read today for the third time. Chair recognizes Representative Nix to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'll reference you to the um, amendment that's in your book um, on this bill. It's Amendment 331166. Um, House Bill 825 uh, was brought to us by the Professional Standards Commission. These are the people who uh, investigate inappropriate behavior by teachers. And all this bill does is will allow them additional time to investigate uh, when an allegation is made and there is an action taken uh, against an educator. As the, the law now reads, they have 90 days from the time that educator appeals to go before an administrative law judge. Many of these become uh, criminal investigations and the district attorney begins to investigate and since the district attorney has no time limit, they have asked that we give them additional time before they have to present their uh, information to the administrative law judge. They don't want to get ahead of uh, the criminal uh, investigation. So all it does really is just change that time frame from 90 days to 180 days that they have to, uh, to have the hearing before the administrative law judge. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that explains the bill, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. If not, you have no you. questions. Thank you. I ask for your favorable consideration of House Bill 825 uh, as amended, amend Amendment 331166. Is, is the gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. We have an amendment. Clerk will read the amendment. Representative Nix, Representative Lindsay, Representative Abrams, offer the following amendment. I'm in the House Committee on Education substitute the House Bill 825. The amendment printed in your calendar books, AM 331166. Is there any objection to adopting amendment AM 331166? The chair hears none. The amendment is adopted. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute as amended? The chair hears none. The committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 825 will vote aye. All those opposed will vote no and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 825. The ayes are 160, the nays are three. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read. House Bill 899. House Bill 899. House Bill 899 by Representative Brockway of the 101st. Bill will be entitled, like men title 21, leading to primaries and elections generally, so advise for the dates of nonpartisan elections, provide a minimum number of members for local boards of election, provide for a form of petitions to qualify as a pauper, to provide for certification of write-in candidates. This bill has been for the House Committee on Governmental Affairs. The committee recommends the bill do pass by substitute Bill's being read today for the third time. We are on the rules calendar and 
the volume of the noise is not so gradually escalating. House will be at order. House will be at order. Chair recognizes Representative Brockway to present the bill. Representative Brockway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I bring before you House Bill 899. Uh, it's a rather lengthy bill, uh, but the items in this bill come from two sources. Uh, first is from the Secretary of State's office. It's an election cleanup bill. There's a number of issues in there, uh, small little issues that have get, been tweaked. and. Uh, as, as elections move forward, you find little things that need to change, and that's where the, a bunch of the items in this bill come from. Those items all have been worked with with the Secretary of State's office with cooperation with elections officials and uh, registrars and superintendents around the state. Uh, so they are all on board with those provisions. Uh, other items in this bill come from uh, the Elections Advisory Council that Secretary of State Kemp put together last year. As you may recall, uh, this group met over the summer. There were representatives of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, uh, as well as uh, representative Inde of independents. Uh, I believe Rusty Kidd was on that committee, Chairman Hamilton, and many others were on that committee. We also had the legal counsel for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party on that council as well. And they made a number of recommendations in a report. Not everything that they recommended is in this bill. Uh, we just uh, included items that had broad support, had, uh, I won't say non-controversial, but just support from all, all sides of the aisle and all the other aisles that there are out there that uh, align themselves politically. So uh, I won't read every section of the bill, but I do want to highlight a couple uh, for your, uh, to give you an idea. Section one, there's been a little bit of confusion about this. As you recall, last year we pass, passed a bill, House Bill 158, that moved the date of certain uh, judicial races from the November election to the July elections. Uh, you'll notice on line 54 and 55, we, uh, excuse me, lines 52 through 55, there's a little section there. This is a section of the code that didn't get copied over. And so this is simply moving this, uh, correcting that. Uh, and the confusion has arisen. A number of judges say, some of you may have had a judge in your, uh, in your area coming to you saying, why are you moving this date again? We're not moving the date again. And the reason we're not moving the date again is because it has to do with House Bill 158 and the definition on line 54 and 55 of nonpartisan general election. House Bill 158 moved the date of the nonpartisan general election to July. This is just correcting something in the code that got missed. Nothing is changing for you judges. Uh, a couple other, other sections uh, that might be of interest to you. Uh, in section five, there's a provision in there that allows uh, incumbents who are independent in this body we only have one uh, but it lists the, lists the requirement on uh, Representative Kidd and any other independent that's out there to have to constantly every time they run for re-election go out and get signatures to appear on the ballot once he's an incumbent no, no real need to uh, to have to uh, make that requirement upon those incumbents uh, section 6, it might be of interest to you, it changes the time when the Secretary of State reports uh, if there's a qualified writing candidate. That doesn't change anything to do with the candidates, play, makes no difference on what, on, on what the candidates have to do. However, it does allow for voters to have a better understanding of when there is a writing candidate. They know at an earlier date and they can be better informed on that. Uh, section 14. Uh, is this is an item that comes from the Elections Advisory Council. It will provide for online voter registration. And the way that will work is if you have a valid Georgia driver's license, you can uh, go online and update your, uh, update your voter registration if you change your address or anything like that, or register to vote for the first time. It will take the database that's in the, uh, at the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles and match that up with your information to make sure that everything is, is fine. Now for folks that, that may not have online access, the paper, uh, paper voter registration form is still available to them. And uh, so hopefully this, will, this is a provision we think will save some money. It costs the Secretary of State's office 83 cents to process every paper uh, voter registration 
application. Online, it will cost only three cents. So it will help, help uh, save some money and also uh, provide greater scrutiny for those that come in. So Mickey, it'll be harder for Mickey Mouse to register to vote in Georgia if we can pass this provision. Uh, Section 37 is something that's come up. Uh, as you all remember, many of the members of this body uh, were elected in special elections since the last time we met last year. Uh, Section 37 would give the governor's office some greater flexibility in uh, when these elections are called. In a situation in between your first and second year of your term, you can, uh, the, it would allow the governor to stack those up, so to speak, so that we could have a bunch of them at one time rather than having uh, one now and one another time. And, you know, we, we, have another, we have another special election actually tomorrow to fill the last vacant seat that's in this body. So this will allow the governor to have a little greater, greater flexibility on when those dates are called. Uh, one other wide item I want to bring to your attention, and then I'll, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that may arise. Uh, section 10, I've had a number of questions about this. Uh, lines 47 through uh, 43, it talks about uh, giving, providing the opportunity for someone who had previously been convicted of a, fe a felony to work uh, in the elections office. What we're doing in section 10 is copying over from section 2128 the exact same code. In other words, there's already a provision, and this has already been the practice around the state of Georgia, that if you had in years past been convicted of a felony uh, and your civil rights had been restored, and there was a 10 year period after your civil rights had been restored, and you had no other felony conviction, that you were eligible for employment in the elections office. Now this, this is not giving new rights to anybody, this is just fixing a, a problem in the code, a conflict in the code. Now, uh, in talking to some, to some attorneys, it is, it is very difficult to have your civil rights restored. So I think that this just really uh, limits uh, people who can, you know, we're not gonna have people who have been convicted of all sorts of crimes suddenly popping up and working in elections office. Uh, this is just transferring this copy from, from 2128, transferring that language over into this section uh, to deal with that and fix that conflict in the law. And uh, that's all that I need to say. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, Mr. Speaker. You, um, you have a question or two. Yes, sir. Do you yield? I do, sir. Yes, sir. Chair recognizes the minority leader of the House, Representative Abrams, to your left for a question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield? I do. Uh, can I direct your attention to lines 431? It's on page 13. Yes, ma'am. Uh, while I generally support the intent of this bill, uh, I would like to understand better the, the genesis of this language because the way I read it, it requires that a person who's securing signatures be able to verify, or at least to the best of their knowledge, know that the person who signs the petition, they know their residence, they know that they reside in the county. What's the offer of proof that this is to the best of that person's knowledge and belief? Um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. I think overall, these, these, this section is is meant to uh, uh, standardize the inf information that's needed uh, for signatures if you're wanting to qualify to run as an independent. And so I think that you know that you know I think it gets back to there on line 41 that the best of the affidavits, aff affidavits, knowledge and belief. I, th I think that's what we'll have to rely on. Okay. Um, further question? Yes, ma'am. So the, the concern I have is that there is a provision 212560 in the same chapter mm -hmm. that says that if you sign something and it, you, if, you, if you're wrong, you, there's the cause of action, a solicitor can come after you for a misdemeanor mm -hmm. for making a false statement. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the way I read this, if a person, to the best of their knowledge, without setting a standard for how that knowledge is, is you know, attained, Right. You have the potential for someone in good faith to go out, secure signatures, mm -hmm. but not to know the resident, respective residents and the, the residents of county and be not only hit with one or two, but multiple misdemeanors based on the mm -hmm. fact that they have 
sworn that they understand where every person on that list lives. Right. And if you've got to secure 5,000 signatures to get on the ballot, 300 of them are wrong, you could possibly face 300 misdemeanors, which I certainly don't, I don't believe is the intent of the bill, but right. the, the effect could be that, let's say, an angry solicitor who had an independent run against him and lost mm -hmm. the election could use this to their advantage as a, a means of harassment. So can you speak to the false statement language that this would um, trigger? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it, that would be up to really, you know, prosecutors in those areas. And, and if somebody is, you know, it's very hard to prove intent in those sorts of things, as you well know. If somebody is intending to go out and, and accurately collect signatures and find out that they've they've made mistakes and so forth, I don't I don't know that that's, you know, that they're, that the prosecutor is going to go after them to the fullest extent of the law. So I think, you know, it's hard for me to believe that that some prosecutor is really going to go after someone for 300 false signatures, to use your example. I think it's, you know, th this is, um, you know, that's, this is the standard practice now in, in, in most, if you're collecting signatures, you, you do the best you can. And if those are not accurate, then they get tossed out and they don't count. And then one final question. Yes, ma'am. Given that, what, what is the necessity of this language? Because if we don't believe that people are bad actors and mm -hmm. we have to rely on the good faith of a solicitor not to charge them, yeah, can you speak to why this language is necessary? Because the rest of this is current law, right. but this new section creates a false statement provision that under the current terms of our code creates a crime where one did not exist before we passed this bill. Right. I th I th it, the, the intent of this section is to simplify that and standardize that procedure so that it's, it's easier to process for the Secretary of State's office for our elections officials. That's, that's, the, that's the intent of this section. Thank you, sir. All right. You Any have, questions? You Mr. have further questions if you care to yield. I do yield. Yes, sir. Uh, the chair recognizes Chairman Hamilton, to your right, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman in the whale yield? I do, sir. Is it not true that the language on line 431 that the lady just spoke of is actually not new language, but it's simply the same language that is being struck at the bottom of the page, line 453, that is already in code? That's true. Yes, sir. Do you further yield? Yes, sir, I do. Chair recognizes um, Representative Taylor to your left for a question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, you? Yes, sir. I have uh, questions about three different sections. Sure. Uh, I'll start with the online voter registration, section 14. Yes, sir. And so help me understand, if I don't have a driver's license, I would not be eligible to register online correct and, but you still have the opportunity all the other opportunities uh, through uh, paper ballot paper uh, forms yes sir and so what is it to prevent some fraud from happening from one person going online and registering 50 different people who happen to have driver's license well it, it's going to uh, it's going to match up with the Department of Motor the, uh, Department of Driver Services database first of all so if there's a phony ID out there it's going to catch that not a phony um, ID but I've just got people's information. They have driver's yeah, it, licenses. It's, it's going to be, uh, actually, this, this section is, is really uh, going to follow guidelines that are in, in the motor voter uh, law that Congress passed a number of years ago. Uh, so it, they're going to set up procedures to take care of that, uh, to protect against that. The, you know, there, there are a number of other states that do this, red states and blue states. Uh, that, that use this, and it's based on you know the the guidelines outlined in the Motor Voter, as well as uh, the Department of Driver Services database. Uh, does the gentleman further you? Yes, sir. Section 24, line 819 to 820. Can you tell me why uh, we're striking having that information available to the public? Yes, uh, lines 819 and, and 820. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a report that. Um, you know, presently, local elections offices have to generate that report. It's just a time-saving and cost thing. It's a whole lot easier. That information can be provided by the Secretary of State's office very quickly and very cheaply. So rather than force the local boards of registration to keep that uh, information on file, uh, folks can contact the uh, Secretary of State's office and get that very quickly and, and at a much cheaper cost. That's, that's actually not how I read the 
Okay. The section that says that they still must keep the information for five years, it just mm -hmm. strikes the language that says they must make it available to the public. Right. Yeah, but the, the information as far as dealing, if you look at other sections, we're, we're beginning to transform from keeping boxes of stuff to keeping electronic records. And so the Secretary of State's office uh, has uh, the ability to produce reports that may be necessary from this information very quickly and very cheaply. But if I'm in not near a local Secretary of State's office, mm -hmm. uh, I can go quickly to my county elections office. Why wouldn't that information be available? Well, they to can the they can order that report for you, uh, you know, and they can generate for you, and or you can pick up the phone and call the Secretary of State's office. They can provide that very okay, quickly, sir. Two more brief questions. Absolutely, sure. Uh, section uh, 17 about removal from the rolls. Can you tell me? I'm trying yeah. to understand and just help me make sure if I'm reading this correctly. Um, the county registrar can use essentially any information that they have on a person's death uh, to remove them from the rolls, and then they send well, something to yeah, them. Not, not any information, just the information that's listed here. Verifiable knowledge of the death. And then they right. would send a letter acknowledging that we've removed so-and-so mm -hmm. so person because they're dead. Would it make more sense to send a letter first and then give people a time where they could count, contact their registrar's office if, in fact, they're using wrong information to remove people from the rolls? Um, well, <coughs> excuse me. I, you know, I, I suppose you could look at it that way. I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think counties that you and I live in are, are going to be dealing with this very much. I think it's going to be your more rural counties where, you know, they're more like, much more likely to know everybody in that town or that, that community. So I, I no, I, I think, I think this works, this works well, sir. Uh, and my. My final question, um, section five, you referenced um, independents not having to submit their mm -hmm. form again. Can you tell me if that would apply if an independent is drawn into a completely new district that was a result of redistricting? Would they have to go to the new voters and ask them to be on the ballot or would they just revert back to the old district? I, th I think it would apply if, if, you know, if an independent were drawn into a new district if he's still going to be listed on the ballot as an incumbent, which I think would be the case in most cases, uh, then no, he would not have to. Now, if he were to decide to go seek a different office, then yeah, he, he would so go back under is, the... So if the district is 99% new, those 99% of the voters have no say if, so on whether that independent if he's going is to be, on the ballot. If that incumbent is going to be listed, if that independent is going to be listed as an incumbent on the ballot, that, that's how I read it. He would not have to. My final question, did the gentleman give any thought to... Uh, having closed primaries in Georgia, so that so that the integrity of the primary process is maintained in Georgia, and we don't, well, and we have parties and people who are members of political parties deciding the nominees for their political parties and not having crossover votes. Did the gentleman ever consider that? And, well, and, I, I, and I didn't want to deny the Democrats in my heavily Republican area the opportunity to vote for me, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Taylor. <laughs> Mr. Do, you, do you yield for further questions? Um, I'll take one more, Mr. Chairman. One Speaker, more. Sorry. One more. Chair recognizes Representative Hardin to your right for a question. Yes, sir. Will the gentleman in the well yield? I will, sir. Although my question is not in the same spirit as a couple of the previous, I do have one regarding uh, page 15, section 14, uh, regarding the um, uh, registration application on the Internet. Yes, sir. And... If you turn the page onto page 16, lines 531, 532, uh, in regards to cross-reference in the signature that is on file with the DMV, mm -hmm. I've got some concern there that that it may be a little bit easy for you know organizations such as Acorn or some of those to basically use a cell phone, if you will. I mean, a, an iPad or an iPod to mm -hmm. do voter registration. And the way this is written, and I'm not an attorney. Uh, but the, uh, in regards to a Georgia driver's license or identification card, uh, are we saying that it has to be a Georgia identification card? It, yeah, I think even tighter than that, it needs to be, uh, really needs to be a driver's license. That's, that, well, it's, well uh, forms of ID that are in the, de in the database of the Department of Driver Services. So I, I can't tell you if that includes... Uh, any Georgia IDs? I'm not. I'm not sure about that. But they would have to be listed in that database. And, I, and Representative, I would get back to you know this. this these procedures are going to be based off the National Motor Voter Law. Uh, 
you know, 10, 10 or 12 other states use these procedures, and that's what we're, that's what we're going to model it, model it after. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will, uh, I will take one more question. One more question? Yes, sir. I thought your last one was one more. <laughs> or maybe I just misheard. Chair recognizes Chairman Hamilton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman in the whale yield? Yes, sir. Is it not true that the Motor Voter Act has been around since 1993 by federal law? Yes, sir. Is it not also true that the local uh, governments around the state, the 11 states that are currently doing this, have seen a reduction in cost of 83 cents per application down to three cents per application while they use this electronic registration? Uh, yes, sir, I believe that to be true. Is it not also true in those 11 states that as they have looked and compared the data over the years, that there is no change in the percentage of Republicans or Democrats that actually vote in election? That's true, sir, yes, sir. Is it not also further true that they, because of this, that they estimate it not only represents a cost reduction to the hardworking citizens of this great state, but actually because you have to have another branch of government to match up with the Secretary of State as well as their signature, that we well show that the act of voter fraud and fraud and registration actually declines as a result of this electronic registration? Yes, sir, I believe that to be true. And so we say that if we can reduce the cost plus decrease the likelihood of fraud, our concern over iPads and cell phones, which were items that were brought up consistently throughout the debate of this bill, we find there's no reason not to push this, this measure forward. I agree, sir. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Speaker, with that, I will yield the well. And I, I ask, ladies and gentlemen, I ask for your favorable consideration for House Bill 899. Thanks. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 899 will vote aye. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 899. The ayes are 129, the nays are 37. This bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. The clerk will read a resolution. House Resolution 1700 by Representative O'Neill of 146, a resolution relative to adjournment and for other purposes. I would think this might be one measure you want to pay attention to. Chair recognizes the majority leader of the House to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the House, uh, do we have it up, Mr. Clerk? Or? There we go. Uh, as you know, we're already resolved in through Monday, March the 12th. So this picks up Tuesday, March the 13th, and Wednesday, March the 14th. We'll then be out Thursday and Friday, back the following Monday through the following Thursday, March the 22nd, which will be day 30. Seven. Also, for scheduling purposes, and I'll mention this again when we adjourn today, 
Uh, we'll be coming in at 9 o'clock next Wednesday, day after tomorrow, just so you all know ahead of time so you can plan accordingly. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'd ask for everyone's favorable consideration of this adjournment resolution, which has been agreed to by the, us in the Senate. We're getting closer to the end. You don't appear to have any questions, Mr. Leader. Okay, you the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. All those in favor of the adoption of House Resolution 1700 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of House Resolution 1700. The ayes are 162, the nays are zero. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Chair recognizes the Chairman of the Rules Committee for an announcement. House will be in order. This is the time you start going, ooh. <laughs> uh, at 3.15 today, in 3.41, here. Here. there will be a Rules Committee meeting to set a supplemental calendar. That's not all. Tomorrow, Rules will meet at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have some other announcements. Uh, the chair recognizes the uh, chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, Chairman Cooper, for an announcement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. To members of the House Health and Human Services Committee, as soon as we break, uh, we need to have a quick meeting in the ante room. So as soon as we break, will members of the Health and Human Services Committee meet me in the ante room. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Appropriations Full Committee will be meeting at 3.30 in room 341 or upon the adjournment of the Rules Committee. Again, full committee, 341, either 330 or upon the adjournment of rules. Chair recognizes the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Chairman Willard, for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The members of the Judiciary Committee, if you will meet with me down on your left front here, since the ante room will be taken up upon adjournment, we've got a quick amendment we need to do on one of the bills we passed this morning. So, members of the Judiciary, Meet over here in the left front corner. Chair recognizes Chairman Sims for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Intergovernmental Coordination Committee will be meeting up in 403 uh, when we break. I need all of the members that's, that aren't subject to the other committees. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Amerson for an announcement. The Science and Technology Committee will not meet Wednesday morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
we got a little bit more time before the first of those uh, afternoon meetings. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 972. House Bill 972. House Bill 972, Representative Weldon III. Bill to be entitled Act Men Title 43 relating to physicians, acupuncture, physician assistance, cancer, glaucoma treatment, respiratory care, clinical perfusionists, orthotics, prosthetics practice, or provide for additional powers of the Georgia Composite Medical Board relating to pain management. To enact the Georgia Pain Management Clinic Act, been Title 45 relating to death investigations by coroners, which require coroners to report to the board when a death may be the result of medication administered or prescribed. Bill has been for the House Committee on Health and Human Services. The committee recommends the bill pass by a committee substituting the bills being read today for its third time. Chair recognizes Representative Weldon to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. I bring to you today um, House Bill 972. This is the uh, Georgia Pain Management Clinic Act. And what this does is this provides the Medical Composite Board of Georgia more specific authority to um, regulate and uh, oversee pain management clinics. Um, the purpose is to provide licensing of pain management clinics and to provide oversight. Um, if you we also have a, an amendment which uh, is a result of uh, an omission. It's actually an inclusion of this language in the wrong part of this bill. The, um, this bill requires that any pain management clinic that has over 50% of its uh, patient population that it's treating for long-term chronic pain uh, which is 90 days or more uh, with Schedule II or Schedule III drugs that they'll have to register with the Georgia Composite Medical Board. Um, the, the, we did leave out uh, hospitals and um, ambulatory, care, or ambulatory uh, surgery centers and um, hospice and home health agencies. And the reason for that uh, exemption for them is because we just don't have a problem at this point. Or we're not aware of any problem with those agencies. Um, this uh, requires that physicians and pain management clinics that are registered with the board, they have to notify the board in the event that uh, the ownership changes if, uh, they, uh, if a uh, physician leaves that is conducting the pain management uh, in that clinic or if uh, they have a, an employee who violates uh, the Georgia Controlled Substance Act. Uh, let's see here. The, uh, payment, the uh, license can be denied or revoked uh, if, they, uh, if they, there's been furnished uh, fraudulent information to the board, if uh, one of their employees have been convicted of a crime, or um, if the uh, federal registration and ability to prescribe pain management drugs has been suspended or revoked. Um, if there's a violation or if someone's operating a pain management clinic and they're not licensed like they're required to under this bill, that would be a felony. And the reason we put that in there is because we have, we're, we're one of the states that we don't manage or limit who can own a pain management clinic. And we have, uh, for example, in Florida, before they enacted their legislations, 93 of the top 100 physicians who prescribed uh, uh, main, uh, pain management drugs, which I mean Schedule II, which are the narcotic drugs and the addictive drugs, and Schedule III drugs, they had 93 of the uh, doctors, uh, top 100 doctors, that uh, prescribed the most drugs. We don't want that in Georgia. And, and they also had a, have a main or, or a huge problem with uh, uh, these drugs getting out and coming up and down our highways. We don't want ours, uh, that happening here in our state. Um, the uh, license will be reviewed or renewed uh, biennially, and uh, they'll do that with the um, medical composite board. 
And that's essentially what the bill does. There are no questions, Mr. Speaker. Or I, I'm, I will yield for any you questions. You do have a couple of questions. Do you yield? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I do. Chair recognizes Representative Setzler to your right for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? I sure do. I just had a question on a provision on, on page 5, lines 160 and 161. Yes, sir. It reads, the board may enter into agreements with other states or with third parties for the purpose of exchanging information concerning licensure of any pain management clinic. Last year, we were very careful in crafting a bill that uh, ensured that the information in this, this database that was established was carefully safeguarded within the state and was not shared outside the state. Uh, what kind of information does this provision on line 160 and 161 allow to be shared with uh, third parties or with uh, other states? Thank you, Representative Sessler. I think that's a great question. That allows for the Medical Composite Board to share uh, with other states, for example, Florida, um, if they have revoked a license for a physician down there or if they're aware of a physician who's been prosecuted for violating their Pain Management Clinic Act, then they can share that with us and likewise we can share that with them. I don't believe this, this is the information that we're seeing right here does not relate directly to any personal uh, uh, medical record or information regarding any specific patient. And again, to the author, uh, do, do you yield for a further question? I will. I just, I, I'm concerned that, um, and again, I know that this, this late hour, this may not be the best time to debate this. I'm just concerned um, at how broad this may be. And uh, you recall how, how diligent we were last year to, be, to, to put those safeguards in place. I would just ask the gentleman through the process to make sure that we, we stay within the spirit of that if that's how this is being represented. Thank you. I, I certainly agree with what, you, uh, what you're saying there, and, and, and we're definitely going to look after the, uh, uh, the, the privacy of individuals. And the Health uh, Care um, Insurance and Portability Act, I believe, will apply to all this information if, as it relates to individual patients. And that would be preempted, and accordingly, that would be providing um, uh, privacy to individual patients. Thank you. You have another question if you yield. I'll yield, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Kidd to your left for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, yield. Yes, sir. I'm very much in favor of what you're trying to do, and, and I apologize for not answering, asking this question in committee, but on page four, line 30, uh, all pain management clinics shall be wholly owned by physicians licensed in this state. I believe that a few years ago, feds kicked down something that says uh, physicians could not self-refer. So if a physician owned a, uh, a clinic of this type, then he couldn't refer his own patient to that clinic. Uh, yeah, does, that super, does this supersede that earlier law? No. This, this just deals specifically with the licensure of a pain management clinic. Now, if a physician is practicing in other um, specialties, then, you know, he would have other issues to deal with. Um, but I don't believe this is going to directly affect that law. No, sir. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, if there are no further questions. You have another question if you yield. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I'll yield. Chair recognizes Chairman Martin to your right for a question. Gentleman yield. Certainly. The, I, I understand, I, I believe, what the gentleman's trying to do, and that's to control the, the narcotics and the treatment that would come through these clinics, and I applaud you for that. My concern, and I draw your attention to lines 130 through 132, it, it, if, if I read that correctly, if the owners of the, the clinic is incorporated, all of the shares must be owned or all the membership must be held by licensed physician and licensed physicians in the state. Is, is that what the author <clears throat> intended to do? That, that is exactly what we intended to do. But I want to, before we go further, I want to um, draw your attention to the um, earlier in the bill. If you'll look on line 113 in the definition of pain management clinic, the term pain management clinic does not include, or it says shall not include, 
any clinic or practice owned in whole or in part or operated by a hospital licensed pursuant to Georgia law or a health system or an ambulatory surgery center, hospice or home health agency licensed pursuant to Georgia law. So what that does is that leaves out those folks who have a legitimate health care interest in providing health care to Georgians and those who are here in our state. And, a court, and, 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 that in, and doctors uh, are the ones that, this is, or that should be owning these clinics that are not owned by hospitals and ambulatory uh, surgery centers, et cetera. Okay, yeah. Try to put this in the formal question. Is it not true? I'm, I'm concerned that a doctor operates those clinics and prescribes the medication. Who is the owner in terms of finance and why sh should we limit the, the economic benefit or for that matter the economic risk associated with owning the clinic? Not operating. I understand what the gentleman's trying to do there, but why should we limit if, if a corporation is involved in multi-phases? Well, why should they not be able to own as long as they operate it according to the rest of your legislation? Well, here's why. Right now we have in Georgia, I could own a pain management clinic. And as, as interested as I might be in, in good health care, I don't have a licensed or legitimate state recognized interest in medical care other than my own personal care. Now, what the, if we don't limit this to doctors and those who have legitimate health care interest, then what we have is we have a way for anybody. We can allow those thugs coming out of Broward County, Florida, that, are, that Florida's running out of their state, and those thugs and, and organized crime running out that are getting run out of other states coming here to Georgia because we don't keep them out. And that's what this is directly, this, this, this bill is directly related to uh, uh, focused on doing is limiting who can have these interests. And when it comes to operation and ownership, it's been demonstrated here in, in the metropolitan area in Sandy Springs and other areas where we have people who have no legitimate uh, health care interest. They own these clinics, they set them up, and they, ha they, hire, they hire a physician to write the, the uh, the prescriptions, and that physician doesn't need any uh, rights to practice or privileges to practice in any hospital. All they're doing is essentially rubber stamping prescription pads. Then after they've seen that physician for about two minutes, they walk next door with a handful of prescriptions and walk to the office next to them, and they fill them in a dispensary that's in that same pain management clinic with, <clears throat> with the, uh, the, the prescriptions that they have. I, understand what I, the, I was just captivated, Representative. <laughs> by you. I, I won't belabor the point. I understand what the gentleman's trying to do. My, my concern is could, could we not apply those same requirements in terms of, of being in good standing to the owners? I, I'm just concerned that we're limiting legitimate economic interest, it's not, not uh, providing an opportunity for the, the example that you mentioned coming out of uh, our neighboring state in Florida. I'll leave it go with that. Actually, uh, uh, to the member in the well, uh, the, the chair is aware that you're a member of the rules committee, and I wanted to remind you in case you wanted to go, I think they're meeting right now, so uh, not to influence your decision about taking the many questions that you have talked yourself up to, but... Uh, I, I certainly appreciate that subtle reminder, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'll yield the will. And I ask for your favorable consideration uh, both on the amendment and the bill. Thank you. The gentleman has yielded the will. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to ad uh, adopting the amendment? The clerk will read the amendment. Go ahead and put it in there. Representative Weldon, Representative Cooper. Offer the following amendment, amendment the House Committee on Human Health and Human Services Substitute, House Bill 972. The amendment's printed in your calendar book, upper right hand corner, AM 331159. Is there any objection to adopting amendment AM 331159? The chair hears none, the amendment is adopted. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute as amended? The chair hears none. The committee substitute as amended is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? 
The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 972 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of House Bill 972, the ayes are 124, the nays are 38. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. The chair is instructing the clerk to immediately transmit the adjournment resolution over to the Senate. For what purpose does Representative Mitchell rise? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I request that uh, House Bill 673 be recommitted to the Rules Committee for some tweaking. Clerk will read. House Bill 673 by Representative Mitchell of the 88th Bill be entitled Act to enact the Georgia's Return to Play Act of 2012. On the motion of the representative that House Bill 673 be recommitted to the Rules Committee, is there objection? Chair hears none. It is so ordered. Chair recognizes Chairman Maxwell for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The rules of the rules. The retirement committee will meet tomorrow at 10 o'clock in room 406 in the CLOB. Retirement committee will not be in our normal room. We'll be in 406 tomorrow at 10 a.m. Retirement committee. Thank you. This house will be in recess until 4 o'clock p.m. <laughs>